Uh, so, yes. So, I am going to talk about the verb forms, which have puzzled me for almost 10 years, but finally I think I, I have understood the puzzle. Um, hopefully. We'll see what you think of my ideas. So I, I, I want to present the, the problem, the issue, give a very sketchy background, um, give you my proposal, uh, go through all the forms, then some constructions, and then uh, combine that into what I have called pedagogical paradigms that I use when I teach. Um, and then talk about the functions of the forms and at the end something about subject marking and tone very little because that are subjects of their own and then um, a summary and I better start with a disclaimer that I will today only talk about regular verbs I will not uh, take into consideration the verb yahai, since it has um, a number of additional forms uh, that will not be covered in today's talk. Um, and I think that is not that strange because this kind of verb um, exhibits uh, more forms than regular verbs in, in many languages that I have looked into so um yeah this kind of verb seems to behave a bit differently um in many languages so my issue my problem with the prevalent description is that uh, f there is some variation between different analyses or presentations of, of, of Somali verb inflection. Uh, most presentations analyses are quite complex, difficult to to process and, and fully understand. Um, and sometimes I also have a feeling that they maybe don't really cover all possibilities. Um, and I think that the basic issue is that uh, forms are not really treated separately. Forms, constructions, and their functions, and sometimes even derivational um, issues are mixed uh, in, in many presentations. Um, and I've read Said's presentation again uh, during the last couple of weeks and um, it is quite complicated to follow uh, parts of it and uh, I try to um, just write down my understanding of uh, parts of it and ended up with this kind of form being defined as main clause positive present general tense uh, and uh, of course one could divide that up and say that it's this part of it is the form and this is the function but it's presented all together not really uh, pointed out that there is a or could be a difference between form and function <clears throat> so so this um, division between form and function is what I am looking for um, and um, these forms or these things are, are presented without really talking about mood very much it's so um, my question is also what kind of mood are we dealing with here <clears throat> is it is it main clause mood subordinate clause mood or What's the mood? Uh, and negative positive, is that a mood in Said's understanding? Because it's not completely clear to me. Um, so what I would like to propose is, based on my teaching, 
um, which has really forced me to think about these things in order to be able to explain it to, especially to the Somali speakers, uh, uh, but but also to the people who want to study Somali as a foreign language. And I've arrived at the view that it's really important to define first, define the forms, and then discuss the functions of those forms. So what I would like to propose is that um, we also, yeah, we also need to to um, talk about some constructions. So so we have forms consisting of one word <clears throat> with one inflectional ending, and then we have constructions consisting of of two verb forms, uh, and then we have functions where these forms and constructions are <clears throat> used. Um, and in my opinion, negative is not a form. It is a function in which a certain form is used. And uh, the forms ending in o, it, and an with a falling tone, <clears throat> as well as forms ending in in, or just n or nin, uh, could be referred to as subjunctive mood forms. Um, other labels are, of course, also possible, like irrealis or something. Uh, but uh, I think it's um, uh, that subjunctive works well and uh, is something that many students have encountered in other languages. And there are certain similarities in the functions that Somali subjunctive and subjunctive in other languages um, are used. To cover. Um, then I would say that most tones can be conveniently treated not as directly associated to the verb forms, not directly involved in the morphology, but uh, rather as effects that are contributed by constructions and functions. But this is a different topic, maybe. I would probably need a, a whole talk just to talk about my ideas about tones. So I will not go very much into that in this talk. And the same is true for subject marking, which I also would say is not really part of the verb inflection. It is something that is added at the phrasal level. And if the phrase ends with a verb, the subject marking ends up on the verb. Um, but I think it could be more conveniently treated as a some kind of clitic morpheme that um, ends up at the end of a noun phrase. And um, depending on what kind of word is the final one in that noun phrase, it can end up on a verb. But I don't think that uh, the morphology of the verb per se uh, really needs to deal with uh, individual uh, paradigms for subject marking. So just very, very shortly, some examples from Panza and, and Said. So, for example, uh, Panza talks about indicative and subjunctive mood, but he uh, lists all these kind of negative things as indicative mode uh, and, and lists it together with the negation, which I would then uh, prefer not to do. I would uh, prefer to just see the form of the verb as independent and call this the subjunctive mood. <clears throat> um, and um, what Panza has as subjunctive mood is rather something that I would prefer to call a function of uh, this form, uh, subordinate clause 
its use in a subordinate clause, uh, which is then a function. And the form is still the same form as in the preceding uh, illustration from Panzer. Um, and if we just have a very, very short look at Said's uh, introduction to um, the inflection of verbs, uh, he um, identifies uh, lots of things um inflectional categories but to me it's a bit unclear what status all these inflectional categories really have uh, to me it it, it it is or it, it seems like a mixture of uh, a number of different levels let's say uh, a mixture of forms constructions and functions. Um, and this is not all really, because uh, later on he also adds full forms, reduced forms, and subject uh, versus absolutive forms. So, so there is more to come on the following pages. Uh, and this uh, is of course what I tried to teach when I started teaching, but it never really worked out for me to, to teach this. And instead, over the years, I have ended up um, reanalyzing things. And as I said, I think it's really important to, to um, uh, systematize the forms, the individual verb forms consisting of one verb with one suffix and then uh, refer to those forms in syntactic rules uh, in order to, to um, talk about the functions that each form uh, fulfills. So if we look at the forms we have, um, there are seven persons, if I simplify a bit, of course, it's also number and gender involved here, but I just call that persons um, uh, as a cover uh, term. Uh, and of course, one could discuss if it's really necessary to have seven persons, um, since the first and the third are, are um, the same. But here we have some uh, prefix uh, conjugated verbs that differ and uh, in the second versus third feminine we have the subjunctive forms in id that makes it I think necessary to, to stick with the seven forms. Um, and then we have the, the tense, um, tense aspect mood, uh, morpheme a, we have the person uh, Morpheme T with the number, uh, morpheme N for the plural, which then gives us this basic pattern that is also repeated in, in all practically all the other um, paradigms. So um, the person uh, inflection is really easy, simple to, to describe uh, as a general um, general um, characteristic of, of the all the inflection in, in Somali. Uh, two tenses, present and past, uh, with different morphemes marking present and past, where the past morpheme has two allomorphs, depending on whether it's followed by an N or not followed by an N. Um, then um, two aspects, uh, a simple form, unmarked form that has been called different things um, in, in different analysis, habitual, general, uh, and, and so on. But I think it's the simplest thing is to just call it simple. <laughs> um, and um, since it's the unmarked one, and, and the progressive marked by the suffix a. 
Um, so nothing new here, really. Um, and that gives us the full indicative uh, paradigm, the full, full number of forms in the indicative mode. Um, and I'm talking about forms now. We'll come to constructions if you are if you are looking for the future, for example. Um, and then we have the reduced paradigms, the reduced indicative forms, uh, with the short vowel in the present tense, and and fewer uh, distinctions between the different persons. Uh, which could then be simplified like this, showing only three forms instead of seven, and seeing the one, the first one as a default covering most of the persons. Um, then um, the subjunctive. Um, has the same four uh, categories as the indicative. Oh, maybe I should have put this over here to make it more visually similar to, but I unfortunately I put the past below the present. Uh, but it's still like present simple, present progressive, past simple, past progressive. Um, and the, the, the morpheme, the vowel of the subjunctive, present subjunctive is all, instead of a, uh, uh, the plural uh, forms with the final n has a, a tone that uh, is systematically there, as far as I can tell, it's always there uh, in the subjunctive. And that would make sense because um, these forms are, uh, are um, have a completely different um, uh, morpheme, uh, which is then identifiable as uh, the subjunctive, whereas uh, this one uh, would coincide with the indicative if it weren't for the tone difference. And um, yeah, and then we have the past uh, subjunctive that only has one uh, form that doesn't differentiate between uh, persons. Um, and then, I would say that we also need a reduced subjunctive uh, where uh, the tense distinction is not present, where there is only one uh, uh, simple and one progressive form without any tense distinction. And I'll come, I'll come back to why we need that later on when we come to the functions. Then of course we have the imperative. We have uh, an alternative negative conditional mood, uh, which is a bit unexpected, but it's there. Um, and then we have three non-finite forms. We have um, the infinitive, we have the verbal nouns, and we have an adjectival form, past, passive, participle, if that is more preferred term. Um, and that is, um, I think, what we find in the regular uh, verb conjugation. There are, for, of course, also a few additional, not very frequent forms that I haven't um, 
listed here, but they could of course easily be added like the, the this root past uh, form, uh, for example, and, and also a form that I, I still can't really uh, get hold of the, the potential. I, I, I kind of, I'm not able to find it anywhere <laughs> except in the grammars. Maybe it's um, in poetry that it's used and I'm not enough of a reader of poetry to, 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 to find it. Um, so um, I would be really grateful for examples of real life use of the potential. Uh, but that is, of course, something that can just be added to, to, to these um, forms. So it doesn't really um, constitute any any problem for for my um, uh, way of analyzing things so um, let's move on to constructions that then consist of two verb forms we have a future uh, tense which in the indicative then consists of the infinitive plus the present tense indicative of the auxiliary. So th this form, if we talk about forms, this form is a present indicative. And since it's a present indicative, we can also uh, have it in the reduced form. We can also have it in the subjunctive and we can also have it in the reduced subjunctive, this auxiliary. So that this construction then exists in all the forms that any present tense form can exist in. Uh, so the, the future subjunctive would then look like this. I, don't think I listed the reduced forms, but in order to show all the possibilities, I should have also added the, the reduced uh, indicative and the reduced subjunctive. Uh, then we have the past tense habitual aspect in the indicative. And again, we can also have it in the uh, subjunctive in the reduced forms and so on. Yeah, here is the subjunctive. And then we have uh, an alternative negative present progressive, which consists of something that looks like an auxiliary. Uh, and I think I, 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 would call it an auxiliary, uh, uh, even if, if it really consists of the negation plus the auxiliary higher, uh, probably. Um, then we have the conditional mood uh, in, uh, and then we have uh, if we want to make the conditional mood negative, then of course uh, the same thing happens as any past tense uh, verb form which is negated. It becomes past subjunctive. Uh, so the auxiliary becomes past subjunctive due to the negation. And uh, then I prefer to see the traditional negative imperative, not really as a negative imperative, since it doesn't have very much in common formally. Uh, it, it has this particle that doesn't look very negative. 
it is similar to the optative particle. Uh, so in order to avoid calling it a negative, uh, I've uh, preferred to, to see it as a prohibitive mood. Uh, and then um, it's easier to kind of explain the similarity between the optative particle and this prohibitive particle, I think. Uh, and um, and these um, constructions also uh, have, uh, just like the imperative has a stable uh, high tone that is always there, always realized. Uh, this construction also has a tone that is always realized. Uh, then we have the optative construction. Um, that is a tricky, tricky thing, <laughs> um, since it consists of, of uh, the pronoun in the first and second person and uh, the particle ha in the third person instead of a pronoun. And the tone pattern also differs between the first second on the one hand and the third person on the, sec on the other hand. Um, and in the two final forms, the ones with an N at the end, there are re two possibilities either to use the uh, subjunctive throughout all the forms, which is maybe considered kind of substandard or something. Um, because in most presentations, it's not really mentioned or mentioned quite marginally. And instead, uh, in, in, in most presentations, the forms that look like the past tense forms are the ones that are promoted. But um, in my discussions with mother tongue speakers, um, it, they, they confirm that both forms are, are in use, um, both the form that could then be seen as the subjunctive throughout, even though the tone pattern of the typical tone pattern that I mentioned before of the subjunctive is not present here. Instead, uh, the optative mood has its own tone pattern that affects any any form. So, so uh, whether it's this subjunctive kind of form or this past tense kind of form, um, the tonal pattern is specific for the optative uh, construction. And then we have the negative optative, uh, which again kind of um, adheres to some kind of general principles that when things, if we have this as the as a, 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 a subjunctive form that is involved in the optative mood and we negate that, then we will get the, the reduced uh, subjunctive form in. in. Um, yeah. And then I would just like to summarize this is in some more pedagogical tables, the tables that I use when I teach these things, um, where I also include the future forms and the habitual forms, even though they are not really forms, but constructions. <laughs> but uh, this is what I think works best in, in in um, a teaching environment um, to have the forms plus these two constructions in the paradigms. Um, and this then is the full indicative. And then we have the reduced indicative. 
followed by the full subjunctive uh, and the reduced subjunctive. Where, for example, this, this form is uh, really special to, to this um, set of forms, the future reduced subjunctive. Um, and then the functions of these forms and constructions. I will not really say any being uh, substantial about the functions of the constructions, uh, especially not the, the, the more complex ones, because that would be far beyond what, what, yeah, what I want to focus on today. Uh, but uh, for the subjunct uh, indicative and subjunctive forms, I, I would like to summarize the main, the, the functions. Um, uh, but before doing that, I want to also point out that there is not always a one-to-one -one relation between tense aspect forms and time, real time and function, um, so that we find present progressive often used with future meaning. Uh, we find subclause present progressive uh, expressing simultaneity. Uh, so that uh, if we compare with an uh, English or Swedish translation, we'll find simultaneity expressed by a, a past tense form in, in the sub-clause, whereas in Somali we'll have a present tense uh, verb. Uh, so that's one side of the coin that would have to be, of course, uh, treated in, in great detail in a grammatical description of the Somali verb forms, uh, but that's not really um, the most relevant uh, to, to what I want to talk about today. Uh, instead, um, I want to talk about this kind of things, um, the indicative full forms are used in uh, main clauses with, uh, in positive main clauses with no uh, focused subject. So there's a the basic kind of clause. And it's also used in positive past tense subclauses that contain a subject word where there isn't a subject gap, if you want to uh, define it in a more maybe traditional grammatical uh, way, but I found that um, when teaching Somali subclauses, one or probably the most important distinction to be made is between subclauses that contain a subject word and subclauses that do not contain a subject word. Uh, and, and that's turned out to work really, really well. Uh, for like ordinary people <laughs> who want to uh, learn uh, about Somali grammar, like Somali speakers, um, to make this basic distinction between subclauses with a subject word and without a subject word. Um, so uh, we get subclauses in the past tense uh, with uh, the full indicative forms if there is a subject word in the subclause. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's a, a, a subclause introduced by, by um, a, a, a conjunction like this, or, or uh, if it's a relative clause that is not introduced by, by any uh, juncter at all. Um, Next, um, indicative reduced forms are used in positive main clauses with a focused subject. That's something that is probably not uh, any 
anything that is well, that's mentioned in, in every description, I would say. Um, it's also used in positive subclauses without a subject word. So um, the head of the subclause is the noun um, in the main clause. And there is a subject gap in the in the subclause. Uh, so we get the, the reduced uh, forms. In uh, the subjunctive forms, the full subjunctive forms are used in uh, negative main clauses without any focus. And uh, yeah, the same clause in, in all possible um, forms. Uh, Ali didn't go, Ali doesn't go, and so on. Uh, but it's also used then in positive non past subclauses that contain a subject word. So if we have um, a subject word, an or u here, or even the noun is here, the subject. <clears throat> we get the, the uh, subject, uh, we get the subjunctive since it's not past tense. And finally, the reduced subjunctive forms. We need those forms in negative main clauses with focus. And we need them in any kind of negative subclauses. So, yeah, oh, sorry, I forgot to translate these examples. Um, so that's the indicative subjunctive. Um, then I just added a couple of things that I thought were a bit interesting. The conditional is most of the time, or, or something that is mentioned everywhere, used in, in both main and subclause to express an unreal past condition. Uh, but I keep finding uh, instances also of, of the conditional used as a past future. Um, and um, that's something that I haven't really seen uh, mentioned very much. Um, so we have this while they were having breakfast, they agreed upon what they would do that day, what they should do, would do, were going, were going to do, maybe. Um, yeah, and then I just have an example of the neg negative, the alter alternative negative conditional that could also, of course, be expressed um, with the auxiliary um, lahain. Uh, so we could all just as well have ma u dergi lahain instead of this negative conditional. Uh, optative, I don't think this is very relevant for today's topic, so I just pass by that. Um, instead, I want to say a couple of words about the subject forms that I then think are better um, explained as some kind of clitic endings that are added to the whole noun phrase uh, and may end up on uh, verbs. And most of the time it, it's a long a uh, that replaces a short a uh, or an o. Uh, uh, but in some instances it's an e that uh, is added to these two. Uh, reduced forms and also to the the 
subjunctive forms ending in n, the, the past tense and the reduced uh, subjunctive forms. Um, of course, it's a challenge to explain why there are two <laughs> different um, allomorphs and, and how come they are um, have this distribution. Um, a couple of examples uh, with this subject marked uh, form uh, where we first have the, the phrase uh, not in a clause just uh, as a noun phrase the, the boy working in the sugar fa factory the sugar company uh, with a uh, reduced uh, form um, since there is no subject word in the subclause this is the head of the subclause and there is a gap in the subclause so we get the reduced form um, but if it is if this noun phrase is the subject of a clause uh, then the verb as the final word uh, gets the long a uh, marking the subject uh, and the same is true for the banana that you eat in the subjunctive since there is a subject word in the relative clause it's the subjunctive and here we have a, a, a past tense uh, negative in, used used in a negative uh, clause uh, with the extra e marking the subject. Uh, for tone, just to comment very shortly, I think that tone is stable in certain forms. It always um, occurs in production, in speech, in in certain forms. Um, the imperative and uh, the related constructions, the prohibitive or the negative imperative and the optative. And, and I think semantically they have uh, quite a lot in common. So it seems like a, a sensible system that all these um, uh, forms and constructions have a stable tone. Uh, and then we have things that could be considered nominalizations, uh, the infinitive, which I would say then is also uh, historically part of the progressive forms and the verbal nouns. But for the rest of the forms, uh, there is a lot of inconsistency in, in the realization in um, plain uh, indicative subjunctive forms. Uh, and I think think that uh, maybe tone isn't uh, really part of the inflectional paradigms, but instead rather marking um, something else like marking phrases, marking uh, uh, ends of subclauses, etc. Um, and this is something that I've been puzzled by throughout the project that Laura and I worked on. But uh, in our project, we focused on noun phrases and um, we didn't really get to the verb phrases, uh, which was a pity um, because I think there is uh, a lot of interesting things going on in the, the verb phrases when it comes to tone. And uh, I hope to be able to, to pick up that um, uh, topic again um, and uh, yeah a short summary so my main point today was to to give my view on the indicative and subjunctive paradigms as I would like to propose these paradigms with these forms and these constructions um, and I think with these forms uh, that can be fitted on one page and 
the relations between the functions and forms that can also be fitted nicely into a small table, we can really um, make the Somali verb system um, uh, pos possible to, to um, uh, grasp, grasp it, or maybe not grasp, but make it um, visually <laughs> easy to, to, to um, uh, I, I'm looking for a word that I can't find in English. Uh, överskådligt. Um, well, well, that it can be nicely um, fitted into to, uh, quite small space uh, instead of um, very long uh, descriptions that we find in many um, grammar books today. Uh, and I hope that this uh, kind of this way of presenting things, uh, giving an overview uh, that it doesn't uh, take much space, uh, will help students to uh, understand uh, this verb system uh, a little bit more easily. And then I also added as the very last uh, slide, uh, the terminology that I have come to use when I teach uh, the Somali speakers. Uh, and I hope that they are kind of descriptive, some of them, especially down here, so that uh, it, it makes sense for people who are not very used to grammar and, and uh, yeah, meet all these new Somali uh, terms. So um, I've, I've uh, opted not to use some of the terminology that is found in, in some of the most used uh, grammar books written in Somali and instead introduce a couple of terms of my own. So that's it for today and maybe I, I will come back in the future and say more about tone especially because that's um, a thing that is also very interesting but I left that out for today. <laughs>